You're listening to This Naked Mind with Annie Gross. Hi, this is Annie Grace, and welcome to This Naked Mind podcast, and I'm here with Marcy. Hi, Marcy. Welcome. Hi, Annie. Thanks for having me. So so good to have you. So why don't you sort of take us back to the beginning in your relationship with alcohol? Where did it all start for you? Um, I would say it started, so I'm Italian. Um, and when it really started, my grandfather made his own wine and it was terrible. So they would dilute it in Sprite to kind of give us a taste, to kind of build the taste of alcohol. Um, so I can remember these, these very light pink drinks that we would drink as kids. And um, we actually, I mean, it, it made us feel grown up, but they were just absolutely terrible. So we would try it and then we'd move on to, to Sprite going off of that. But I would say really my alcohol journey started when I was probably a teenager. My friends and I would sneak alcohol at my parents' liquor cabinet, right? And I was the, I was the straight A student, like never got in trouble. So this was kind of my way to rebel is to, you know, sneak drinks away and then top the bottle up with water and blame it on my brothers if we ever got caught, right? So um, that's kind of where things started there. And I was just a social drinker, right? So I went to one of the most Greek universities in the country and there's a lot of alcohol and it was actually one of the wealthier um, universities too. So there was never short supply um, parties everywhere. And, and so we would drink a lot and it really, the thing is I was never really a just have one drinker. So when I would go out and party, it would be kind of to the point of blacking out. And I can't tell you how grateful I am that nothing ever happened and kind of walking around a college campus when I had absolutely no recollection of it the next day. All right. So it started to build and I didn't really notice because it's college culture, right? Like everybody's drinking, everybody's blacking out and passing out on the lawn and it's hilarious. Um, but I missed a lot of opportunities from that. Like I was actually just thinking the other day, I was one credit short from minoring in statistics. I have a, um, a bachelor's degree in business. I was going to minor in statistics, but the last class that I needed was Friday mornings at 8 a.m. And there was just no way that I was going to be at a class Friday mornings at 8 a.m. So I just threw that, you know, all the work I had done away um, in order to kind of save my social life. So um, alcohol kind of became the thing that we did. It was just, you didn't need an activity. You were drinking. That's how you kind of spended the evening. And then it took a different turn. So I studied abroad my junior year in Australia. Um, and Australia has a very heavy drinking culture. And I, that was the first time I, I was actually depressed. So I didn't know kind of what depression was, um, but I ended up spending a lot of that time in my room. It was a, a very small room and I would hide wine boxes um, under my bed and just like, you know, watch things on Netflix um, nonstop, drinking every day. Um, and that was kind of how I coped with the pain and, um, and grief of depression. And eventually, you know, I got on some antidepressants, but that was my immediate go-to is just alcohol. If it won't make me feel better, it'll at least help me sleep or it'll at least help me feel nothing, right? So um, that was kind of the first bout of depression. I had another one um, in law school. I was in law school. I can remember the, it was on my birthday, which is in September, so early in the year. And I spent that, that um, in a property law class crying in the bathroom. And it's not just because property law is one of the most boring things. It's because I just knew this wasn't right for me. And I was really starting to get depressed. And so again, my alcohol use just skyrocketed. It was every day, it was all day, you know, it was just really out of control, but that's, that's what I knew to help me get through it. Right. You know, I had to even get this, I had to use this bandaid to even make the steps to go to a doctor or to try to exercise or to try to do something else. So, um, eventually that bout ended, um, had another one and, you know, just repeated the pattern. Right. And when I was, when I was depressed, I, eventually I met and married my husband. And when I was alone, it, no one saw how much I was drinking, right? But when I married my husband, it became a lot more obvious. So that's when I started sneaking alcohol like I was a 16 year old, right? I would take sparkling waters and I would top it off with vodka so that he'd think I'm drinking water when really I'm drinking alcohol. I would stop by on the way home from work and buy, you know, small, small bottles of vodka that I would hide in my drawers that I know he's not going to go through. Um, so he wouldn't see the, the empties in the, in the container. So um, hiding it became a real key part there. I was just embarrassed by how much I was drinking. I did not want him to know it, but I also couldn't stop doing that. Um, I would say things changed for me. You know, they, again, it was the, it's an up and down, up and down. Um, I went back into the, the spiral of just kind of drinking socially, but socially as you get older, you get more opportunities, right? So networking events, you're going to be drinking, um, going out to dinner, going to the movies, even now they serve wine at the movies, right? Like the number of places that you can drink just continues to grow and grow. So it didn't feel like a pattern. It felt like I was kind of adulting at that point. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it, 
what happened next? Well, so I, this is kind of my favorite time of year, right? Like I love resolutions. I love kind of starting on a fresh, clean page. And so what I did one year, probably back in 2018, 2019, somewhere in there, I decided to try dry January. I'd heard, you know, read articles that alcohol may not be so good for you. And so I decided to try dry January. And I'm a person that dives into books. If I'm going to learn about something, I'm going to read all of the things about it. And so I grabbed your book and a couple other Quitlet books and use that to go through my first dry January. And I think I probably drank two or three times, but you know, one of those days it was like a really hard day. And one of the times like it was a special occasion and so it didn't really count. And so I did my dry January and I repeated that uh, every year, which is kind of something that my husband and I did. And the one time I made it through dry January without drinking, I was miserable. I thought about drinking every single day. I was counting down the February 1st, ready to stay up until midnight to have my first drink. Um, it was just absolutely miserable. I was getting through it and hated it. So I knew that something had to change, but I wasn't really ready to, to, um, to admit it to myself, to admit it to anybody else. I think I had um, probably one of my worst evenings that summer where I drank just completely to blackout and I'm, I'm, I'm not in college anymore, Annie, like I don't need to be doing this. And it was just really embarrassing for me and really dangerous. Like I got myself into some really bad situations. Um, and so I stopped for 18 days and, and then I fell in again. And, you know, a lot of people talk about kind of their rock bottom point and I never had a rock bottom point. Like that probably should have been it. And it, you know, did make me stop for about a week and week or two. Um, but that's not really what stopped it. I really just got to the point where I was just sick of it. Like I knew <laughs> if I'd gotten so much evidence that I cannot handle this by myself, I was finally ready to admit like, yes, this is correct. Like I cannot do this by myself. And so you were just like at this point where you're ready to not do it by yourself. So what did you do next? I am not sure how I found you, but I mean, I had read your book uh, a couple of years ago, but I think you were starting to show up on my Instagram. I think it recognized that I probably need a little help, a little more help than I was ready to admit. And so I signed up for one of your um, classes. It was one of those multi-day challenges that you were doing. And I was just sobbing. Like I just, you spoke so well to kind of that, that grief and the shame and the embarrassment and stuff that you feel, um, when your life is kind of dictated by alcohol. And so I actually enrolled in the path, uh, the path gen uh, January, 2023, I had enrolled. Um, and I decided that very first day I am. So I'm the A plus student. I always do my homework. And that first day I was not going to drink and I quit drinking on January 1st, 2023. Um, mm -hmm. The path was absolutely incredible. Um, and the thing is, so you, you know, you talk about your own, um, your own data point. And I actually had a data point myself in August. Um, I am a perfectionist. And so I hated that this was me kind of breaking my streak. I wasn't counting days or anything, but this was me not being perfect. And I, I, it was really hard for me, which made me want to drink more. But what was happening was that I was going into yet another bout of depression. I spent two days on my couch in PJs watching Netflix and doing nothing else, but just pouring myself another drink until I fell asleep. And Annie, I have never turned it around so quickly. Like on day three, I was like, well, that was fun. We're done with this. Like I'm going for a walk. Like I know that exercise helps with depression uh, and a lot more effectively than alcohol does. And so I started going for a walk and, and I was done. Like it was, it was incredible how quickly I was able to turn it around. I've never been able to do that in my entire life. Oh, that's amazing. That's incredible. Very cool. And do you feel like that sort of experience was very cementing in your overall experience or like, how did, are you thankful for it now? Absolutely. So, um, if thankful, thankful is a hard word, I'm still trying to, like, I accept it, but it's, I would still rather, of course it never happened. Um, but what kind of happened later on in my drinking journey is I started turning red. Like I had never turned red. I always, you know, drink but far more than I care to admit, but I actually started flushing um, when I was drinking. And so on this occasion, I actually have a photo on my phone. I am bright red. Like there's just, you know, a little bit of white kind of around my, my eyes and lips, but I look awful splotchy all over my chest. And I took a picture because I don't ever want to look like that again. Like it wasn't solving the problem. It made me care less about the problem. It wasn't solving it. And it was destroying my skin, destroying my health. Like it was, it was just a really strong reminder that this isn't doing anything for me. Like it's, it's that knee jerk reaction. It's the the thing I've always gone to in the past, but it's just not working for me anymore. And this is like physical proof, you know, on my phone of how it's just not going to cut it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so good to have that kind of reminder 
um, for yourself and also to just allow that like it is a self journey like you have to come to a point where you are the one who's ready and you are the one who realizes you know and I think so much of um so much of our like even before we start something and a lot of that challenge that you had signed up for is all about like being ready to change right like what what needs to happen what needs to be true for you to be able to reach a point where you are actually ready to make a change. And I think there's there's kind of three key things, and I'd love to know your experience if this was true for you, but you basically have to know that change is up to you. That at the end of the day, there's no one else coming for you. And you have to know that it's possible. And I think that's one where we really fall down in our culture, especially if we've tried like with willpower to stop drinking before and we found it difficult, we lose our belief that change is really possible. And then we have to, you know, I mean, an ideally possible in a hopeful way, not possible in a miserable way. But then we also have to believe that it's it's now that it needs to happen. Otherwise, we can just keep pushing pushing the ball further down the um, the court as forever, really. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know that that kind of self efficacy of like, yes, this is on my hands. Like, no one's going to do it for me. No one can quit drinking for me. It, it has to be. It has to be me. Is kind of that that real key. And the the now, it's just really interesting to me that my it's, it's as if my intuition kind of decided that this was the time for me. Like, again, there was just not really any precipitant that said, you know, here's your, your, your lowest point, in your moment, like, this is the reason that you have to change. It was just, I kind of, I kind of got tired of it. And then kind of believing it would work. It was, I, Annie, I am one of the most skeptical people on the planet. Like, if you tell me your program's going to work, I'm going to say, yes, great. Let me see your uh, money back guarantee. Right. So I came into this fully expecting to use it, fully expecting to come in and say, thanks for the shot. I would like my money back, you know, whatever. And and I didn't. And it's just, that's the thing to me is you do the program turn me into a believer, right? Like I came into this fully expecting it to not work, fully expecting to have thrown all my money down the drain and wasted my time. Cause you know, there's a time commitment involved in change. Like change does not happen overnight, right? It takes some commitment. It takes an investment. It takes, um, it, it just takes time. Right. And so I was ready to, I was, coming in, expecting it to not work. And I, and it's magic, I guess. I don't know. That's, that's just all I can, all I can say, because you've, you've turned me into a believer. I love that. And I'll give a distinction to the, to the uh, piece of readiness of believing it's possible. I think that it's, you can be super skeptical, but there had to be a part of you that was like, but maybe, and that's all it needs. Like, it's just this tiny little window, right? Like this tiny little a thread of possibility. Maybe this really is different. Maybe this can possibly work for me because um, where people, when we, when we go through, and usually it's, it's through having tried before and tried other methods before where we get into this uh, learned helplessness of just honestly not believing it is possible. So just say that, like, I think it is um, totally skepticism is like welcome and understood and obviously why we have such a, you know, money back guarantee, but also just this tiny part of like, but maybe, and that's, that's really all the possibility that's needed. Right. So I love that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course there had to be some part of me that recognized there, there is a chance it's going to work. Otherwise it just would have been a complete waste of my time. But I mean, when I considered the alternatives, like I'm not going to pay $30,000 to go to, a month to go to rehab. Right. And I didn't feel like I was bad enough. Right. I was, I was working. I didn't call in sick. I kept getting promoted and, you know, I had uh, five promotions in five years. I was doing really well. I didn't have issues with my husband. I didn't have issues with the law or anything else. Like um, externally, everything was working. Everything was fine. It was just at home and in my own soul, I knew that these things weren't working. So rehab wasn't going to work. AA doesn't appeal to me. I'm, I'm not a really religious person. Um, and there's a big heavy aspect on that. And the other thing is from a, a anecdotally of people that I've met from AA, they're, you know, admitting that they're in recovery and they, they still want the drink. And the beauty of the path is that I don't want the drink anymore. Like I was the person that pitied people, um, that didn't drink or felt that they were missing out or, strange. Like it's, how can you make that decision? You're clearly missing out on something. Um, and so I couldn't understand really a, a, a program that takes that away. Like they're just, like you say, there just is no desire anymore. Like, and what do you think, um, <clears throat> was there like one specific moment for you where you're like, Oh, I just don't want it. Or was it just cumulative over time? 
I I think it was probably looking back that I, you know, realized I hadn't kind of had any cravings. Like we have, we've always had kind of a bar set up in our home and it was, I don't know how many weeks or months into it that we kind of realized like, oh, I haven't even kind of paid attention to that. I didn't have to hide the alcohol for myself because it was just sitting there and it just wasn't tempting me. Like I had, at least initially, I wanted to be the straight A student. I wanted to do the right thing. I was going to go through this time and, and not drink, but then eventually that kind of desire disappeared. Right. So I think it wasn't like one particular moment where I said, you know, I guess I don't really want this anymore. It was just kind of looking back at the things that we've done that we normally would have had alcohol at. Like we normally would order something to drink at a restaurant. We would normally order something to drink at trivia night or, or these other activities. Like just kind of thinking back, like, oh, I guess I actually don't need that to have fun and to, you know, enjoy being with my husband. I love that. I love that. So um, how has it been for you socially? It's been, you know, I feel, I feel bad admitting this, but it's actually been fairly easy. So my husband um, in solidarity decided to quit drinking as well on, on January 1st, and he still hasn't had a drink of alcohol. And he didn't do kind of any of the, the the soul work that I had to do for it. And he is doing just fine, has no desire to go back. I have friends who've just come up to me and they get really excited. And they're like, Marcy, I haven't had a drink in, you know, three weeks or, uh, you know, they're just really excited. And I'm like, great, good for you. Right. So um, I think, I think part of the reason is that I was a lot of the instigator, like it didn't matter what the activity was. I'm like, Hey, should we grab a beer for this? Right. So uh, I think me not telling people that we should order a drink at this not normally drinking activity has kind of, you know, even things out that, you know, I'm just enjoying my friends for being my friends. They've been really supportive and I've just been really lucky that way. Well, that's amazing. That's really cool. Um, and, <clears throat> and how has it been sort of career wise? You know, so I, I think that the points of depression really tied into, um, the lack of fulfillment in my career, right? So when I was in Australia, I was really working on my, my business degree and I, I really wanted, you know, I was going for it because I wanted the title and the salary. But as I was coming towards those things, it just wasn't, it wasn't hitting it for me. Right. And then again, in law school where I was in law school and I knew this wasn't for me, but I'm not a quitter. Right. So I, I figured a degree is better than a semester at the university. At least it kind of shows that I finished something and that I have some kind of education behind me. Um, so those kind of points, that's when my drinking really ramps up. And it wasn't until I quit drinking that I realized um, that I am actually capable of so much more, right? Like I was so impressed um, with the impact that coaching can have, something that I, I didn't even realize existed, that that's something that I wanted to pay forward. Like it's just, it's it's incredible that I now have the self-efficacy that I can actually start my own business. And, you know, things are hard, but I, one of the things, I can't take credit for this, but someone in the in my path group had, had mentioned, you know, that we can do hard things. And that has become kind of my life motto. Like starting my own business has been hard. Like it is hard most days. It is exciting because it's in my hands and I am a control freak, but it is hard. It is exhausting. And I have taught myself that I can do hard things because with alcohol, I didn't have to, right? I would just quit. If I couldn't do something, I would quit. If I wasn't going to be good at it, I would just quit. I would, you know, push it to the side and say, that's kind of not for me. And this, you know, something new, I, I'm not good at it right off the bat, right? Like this is something, this is a brand new adventure. This is not something I've done before and I'm learning, but I am treating it as a game, right? So I, the learning aspects are, okay, that didn't work, but what can I do next time? And it's exciting. It's stressful, but it's exciting. And I, I would not have continued with this if I were drinking because <sighs> drinking said I could throw in the towel. I could throw in the towel and we could just sit on the couch and watch, watch Netflix with wine tonight. We don't have to do the hard things, but I can do the hard things. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's so empowering to feel like that's true on your own, you know, without needing the medicine, it medicine and very loose <laughs> self medication of a substance to be able to do those hard things. Just really, yeah. really, really incredible. Absolutely. Very cool. Well, let me ask you the question to kind of finish up with, which is if you were going to go back in time and talk to yourself about sort of what uh, life is like now, what would you tell yourself? You know, the thing is, I don't think that there's anything I could have said to you know, the past version of me that she would have believed. Like I was the person expecting to, you know, sneak alcohol into the retirement home. Like I was the person who couldn't understand why people didn't drink unless there, you know, was a religious aspect behind it, because that's what people do. Like that's the benefit of being an adult is that you can drink. Right. So there's not really anything that I could say to me to say, you know, to pass version of me to say, this is how, how life is going to change. Um, but if I were going to go back and give her advice, I think I would tell her that she could do hard things. She just did not 
have the belief that she could do things um, because she didn't have the experience. She never had to try and to really um, commit to something because she could drink away the negative feelings or, or just pass it away. But that, that little girl had such a big future in front of her and she just has no idea. And it's just absolutely incredible, um, the change that's possible. I love that so much. That's just awesome. Well, what a joy to have you and, and hear your story. It's just been incredible. I love it. Thank that. you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you're ready to see how This Naked Mind can help you on your personal health and wellness journey and want to learn more, go to thisnakedmindpodcast.com to learn what your next best step is. Again, that's thisnakedmindpodcast.com. We have all of our free resources, programs, social links, and more available for you there. Plus, if you have your own naked life story to share, you can submit it there as well. Until next week, stay curious. 